So welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that shape our world, inspire future creators, and everybody that likes a really good story. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your aging health and longevity ambassador along for this ride. And so on the last several shows, we've been uh, spending a lot of time at you know, what we refer to as sort of the different hierarchical levels of aging and disease. Uh, and we've been speaking with a broad range of experts in the field. Uh, we've had MDs and we've had PhDs. Uh, we've had geneticists, embryologists, biophysicists. We've even had a quantum biologist. Uh, we've had guests nominated for a range of awards, including the Nobel. Uh, all very amazing thought leaders. But um, Far from all the great ideas and discoveries in the biomedical realm happen by a defined plan. Now, many of the greatest discoveries in, in this industry happen by accident, and not all of them happen in laboratories at the bench. Uh, a few examples, you know, Alexander Fleming accidentally discovered penicillin by leaving his petri dishes near the window to be contaminated with mold. Uh, the rest is history. Um, it was sloppy lab technique uh, at Sandoz that, uh, you know, caused Albert Hoffman to accidentally absorb LSD and do an unplanned end of one clinical trial on himself. Uh, and the rest of that is history. And of course, you know, the technicians running the early clinical studies uh, on a blood pressure drug known as Viagra noticed a very interesting side effect in the male subjects. Uh, and the rest of that was history. Uh, and so, you know, taking a, a step back from bioscience, uh, you know, we need to remember that a guy named Albert Einstein uh, used to refer to his time hanging out, not in the lab, but in the Swiss patent office, uh, which he referred to as a worldly cloister where he hatched his most beautiful ideas, including Brownian motion, quantum theory, and special relativity, some of his most productive and important time. Uh, the potential of the human mind is truly amazing when we take time to quietly sit and think. So today's guest, who I really think epitomizes this concept and you know, what we need to see more of along these lines, especially in this fast-paced, hyper-connected world of biotech, uh, and really fits the idea Michel model of profiling big thinking, creative new ideas, uh, is Jahari Finley. Uh, Jahari has three degrees. Uh, he's a patent lawyer. Uh, he is an MBA, and he's a master's in biotechnology. Uh, and he is a quite accomplished patent attorney who specializes in intellectual property protection in both the biotech and pharmaceutical sectors. Um, he was the first person ever to publish about metformin, which is a commonly prescribed anti-diabetic drug and extremely hot topic nowadays in the area of aging research, and its ability to ameliorate the accelerated aging one sees in children's cells uh, that have the genetic disease Hutchison-Gilford progeria. Uh, he also went on to publish about connections between HIV-1 latency and progeria and how they're intimately connected to the same protein that metformin has been shown to activate, uh, AMPK or AMP-activated protein kinase, which plays a very critical role in cellular homeostasis um, involved in fatty acid oxidation, ketogenesis, and a variety of other activities. Uh, and has also published quite a bit lately about sort of this a AMPK linkage between jumping genes, telomerase, activation of human oocytes, you know, a wide range of very interesting topics. So uh, with all of that, um, let's bring in Jahari Finley. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thanks so much for having me, Ira. It's a great, it's a great pleasure. So we, we usually start the show off just by, you know, giving our guests the floor just to take some time to learn about you, tell us about yourself, where you grew up, how you became interested in this uh, sort of triad of science, law, and business, and then ultimately how you, you know, decided to leverage it into this, uh, the area of biomedicine and, you know, not just develop patents, but also come up with new ideas in the process. Yeah, uh, my background is going to be a little bit different than uh, your typical MD, PhD person. Uh, there was not no one in my immediate family, you know, that had, you know, PhDs and MDs in sciences and life sciences. So I didn't have any immediate access uh, to, to, to those type of people, any type of mentors. So as a young kid, you know, growing up in the 80s, you know, uh, one of the ways that I really grasped on to science is through media, you know, science fiction. You know, which really kind of sort of blew up in the early 80s, you know, mm -hmm. the Star Wars movies and, you know, uh, 
you know, in some of the movies that sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, branched off from there. But I was originally born in Oakland, California, uh, you know, in the mid 70s, and my dad was in the military. And he actually graduated uh, from Berkeley, and he was an African American studies major. And interestingly, uh, I didn't know I was going to follow this path, but he uh, was actually planning on going to uh, law school. So I had no idea that I would actually end up graduating from law school, you know, you know, later on in life. But uh, that's, you know, the area that he wanted to uh, go into. But uh, my father died when I was uh, pretty young, three or four years old. So my mother uh, moved back to Alabama, which is basically where I was raised and spent, spent most of my, uh, my, adult, my childhood and early adult life there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but like I said, I was always into science fiction. I was always into fantasy, these huge, fantastic adventure movies where the, the, the protagonist was the most unassuming characters you could ever think mm -hmm. of. You, know, you think of Lord of the Rings, you think of, you know, hobbits, and they're tasked with this huge, you know, this huge uh, 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 you know, the task of saving the world, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have none of the powers that all the other characters have. You know, they're not a Gandalf. There's no magic going on. There's nothing but pure will, sure. heart, desire, and courage. So, you know, I was really attracted to those type of movies. You think about the Indiana Jones, never-ending stories, dark crystals, and stuff like that. And, you know, it's funny. I can remember I was sort of, you know, different and, you know, didn't really like to you know, kind of do the same, some of the same things that other kids at my age did, you know, go out and play in sports and stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, in Mobile, Alabama, you know, Mardi Gras is, is sort of a big thing down there. You know, New Orleans is popular for it, but uh, Mobile sort of originated. And, you know, when that, you know, when Mardi Gras season's there, you know, all the kids go out and, you know, mm -hmm. they go and have fun. But of course, I wanted to stay home. I really didn't want to go to, you know, Mardi Gras and, you know, the, the initial, you know, uh, some of the festivities. I want to stay home and watch the opening season of Buck Rogers, you know, in the 21st, the 25th century and, and right. things like that. I mean, that's, that's how important th th those type of shows were for me, you know, and it's funny. I, and and I, it also sort of transcended into, you know, uh, other types of arts, music and things like that. I was very much into different things. It's funny, I can remember uh, in middle school, you know, in the late 80s, you know, there was a in the school class dance and, uh, you know, uh, some of the kids, you know, kind of came in and, you know, they put in this, uh, you know, this uh, rap group, it's called Salt and Pepper. You know, they had a lot of okay. dance, you know, a lot of dance, you know, you know, groovy tunes and stuff. And after they put in that and after it went off, I slide in a cassette tape of this really esoteric, you know, rapper called Eric B and Rakim. And they're talking about, you know, traveling in outer space, you know, seeing other planets and things like that. And of course, that sort of killed the dance vibe of the, <laughs> entire, of the entire thing. So those type of things, you know, uh, really being into uh, the media and science fiction and things like that, Star Wars and stuff, Yoda had me thinking that I can actually you know, engage in telekinesis and stuff, which I really tried to do, you know, in class and, you know, kind of waste the time actually putting my hand out, trying to move different objects and stuff like that, which, you know, I mean, of course, is, you know, you, you can't be a telekinetic here in, you know, the, um, you know, 2019, but, you know, you know, who, who knows what can who happen knows? in the next 100, you know, 100 plus years. So. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, so I was really into that type of stuff, and it transcended into the classroom. So I majored in biology and um, ended up getting my degree from Alabama A&M University. Now, the, the, the original plan was to go to med school. But that didn't work out. But very interestingly, that led me down a path that I couldn't have ever imagined and that I didn't know it existed. And it led me to a place to write things that, you know, you've seen and other people have seen that I couldn't have ever dreamed of. So basically, uh, that went into my drug sales, sales reps years. Mm -hmm. And I had a few friends that uh, actually were biology majors and they were working for drug companies in sales positions. And I had no idea what a sales rep was or sales rep for a drug company was. Mm -hmm. You know, the only thing that I was familiar with was, you know, sales rep from car salesmen to, you know, uh, retail sales or something like that. So I'm like, what is a drug sales rep and what exactly do they do? So I, I sort of talked to my friends and got to know them and stuff like that. And they were saying, no, it's not like how you think. It's more so of a consultative type of sales you know you're not you know forcing a, you know wanting to get a physician to sign on the dotted line here take these pills you know buy these pills and right. you know keep on going to the next you know uh uh physician so i really 
sort of uh, looked into it and I said, okay, this is pretty interesting. I'd really like to know more about it. So I did some footwork, did some networking and got hired by you know, a major drug company, a large drug company. And interestingly, I got hired in their metabolism division. Mm. And this is very important. And this is in the early 2000s. Okay. We're trying to see where this is going. And not only was I hired in the metabolism division, it was in their diabetes uh, specifics unit of their metabolism division. So that is uh, really where I was first introduced to a drug, you know, that, 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 you know, would change my, you know, my future, uh, you know, endeavors, which was called metformin. Now I was signed a, a saponiurea. That's a particular drug class that causes insulin release from beta cells. So uh, it's not really used as first line. Metformin was a first line, considered a first line drug for diabetes. And I also sold a long acting insulin as well. So when patients, when the first line drugs and then the pills stop working for the diabetic patients, then you know, they move along to a, a long acting insulin. Mm -hmm. But it was also known at, at the time in that, in, that, in that particular market is that you, know, you don't sell against metformin. It is first line, all, uh, all physicians put their patients on metformin when they're newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And you, it is very safe and very efficacious. And you try to sell your product, you know, after that. And I'm thinking, well, what is it about this drug that they love so much about, metformin? So, you know, we do some research and, you know, you, you take, you know, get educated in, 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 in diabetes and then the mechanisms of action, you know, with the drug companies. But nobody knew how metformin worked in the early 2000s because nobody had shown how metformin worked in, 2000, in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. No studies had been put out. Metformin had recently approved by the FDA in 1994, mm -hmm. only 1994. So it had been on the market for a few years, but it was working so well and hardly no side effects, and nobody knew how it worked. So I started to look at my old undergrad books, uh, you know, about, you know, diabetes and things like that. And you know, there's really nothing going on in there that could reasonably point to how this drug is working. So eventually in 2000, 2001, uh, the first study came out showing that yes, metformin activates this really interesting enzyme or kinase called AMPK, AMP activated protein kinase. And it basically phosphorylates other different proteins and regulates their activity, turns them on, turns them off. I said, okay, wow, AM, you know what? I was like, well, what is, you know, what is AMPK? Look back in the old undergrad books, no mention of AMPK whatsoever, mm -hmm. even though he had initially been identified in the 70s. And the name uh, was put forth in late 80s, maybe 88. But really, uh, there wasn't a lot of research behind it, you know, you know, going up until then. So I found out and looked at what this enzyme was, and there was nothing in the undergrad books about it. But it seemed to be a very interesting enzyme. And that what I noticed that it's activated by A and P and increases in A and P are associated with stress. It's associated with a, some sort of challenge to the body. You know, exercise increases A and P, mm -hmm. fasting, you know, those types of things. And I thought that was very interesting because, you know, on a very general level, we know that fasting and exercise is good for you. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's basically, you know, works well for the body. Mm -hmm. So, um, Working for the drug company, my sales wasn't really, you know, where I wanted to be. Uh, I was more science focused. I was really detail oriented. So, you know, sort of detailing physicians, you know, you kind of keep it above the ground and you know, mm -hmm. you're not allowed to get too deep into details and stuff. But one very interesting thing that I also noticed when I was a sales rep that actually I kept that in mind was how important patents were to this, to the lifeblood of the company. And, you know, when a patent was approaching patent expiration, you know, companies did a lot of different things to sort of extend that patent. So I noticed that, you know, okay, you know, the, the drugs are working well, you know, it works well, but the patents are almost equally as important as efficacy in a lot of those cases. So uh, that, that really, you know, made an impression on me and I sort of kept that in mind. So I left the drug company, went to grad school, mm -hmm. uh, uh, ended up going to uh, Johns Hopkins University you know, mm -hmm. working on a master's in biotechnology. Now, interestingly, uh, I cho purposely chose a lot of very broad-based classes uh, in physiology in order to get a taste of several different areas. So I'm taking stem cell biology, cancer biology, neuroscience, immunobiology as well. 
Mm -hmm. And again, very cursory mentions of AMPK, but hardly, you know, no, no, no detailed information about it. But what I do notice is that metabolism, metabolism, the mitochondria, energy production is playing a significant role in all these different disease states, you know, all these different physiologies and the disease states that are, uh, are you know, uh, that results from these uh, uh, different uh, uh, physiology. So that so so mitochondria energy metabolism is connecting all these different disease states. And I'm thinking there's something to this. There has to be something to this. So of course in grad school you're also uh, looking at you know current journal articles and you're also looking at you know the, the current literature that's out there. And sure mm -hmm. enough, you know you, you start to go to those early 2000s and mid 2000s. I'm starting to see an exponential increase in the the publication of, uh, of different papers that are looking at AMPK, that are looking at metformin, and then uh, and also you have the discovery of the sirtuins as well, mm -hmm. the resveratrol as well. And what I'm also seeing is that these compounds seem to be having a beneficial effect in several different disparate disease states, but they also seem to be increasing stress. It seems to be causing a cell a temporary to experience stress in a temporary fashion, and the cell responds by becoming stronger. And the and, and cell responds by doing what it was designed to do that much more efficiently. And I'm putting together, well, you know, saying to myself, well, isn't that the same principle as exercise? You know, exercise only works because it hurts initially. Mm -hmm. You know, when, you, when, you, when you're used to running a mile, you know, you run a mile every day and you build yourself up you know, the person who's never ran a mile before, and all of a sudden you put both of you all at the same start side, starting sign, starting place, and mm -hmm. say, okay, now I'll run them two miles. So the guy who's run a mile every day and has preconditioned himself, he can make it through the two miles. The guy that's been sitting on the couch is probably gonna have a heart attack. So I was like, is that the same thing? Is that what's happening with these particular drugs? Is that what is happening with metformin? Is that what's happening with resveratrol? Is that what AMPK is responding to? And this sort of takes me back to the whole, my whole, you know, fixation with the interconnectedness, uh, interconnectedness of things. It comes back from the sci-fi movies, mm -hmm. you know, from the Star Wars movies. You know, Yoda say everything is connected. Life and death is the same thing. The same thing that brings forth life can take life. There's this fundamental connection between all things. And I wasn't aware of quantum physics and quantum mechanics at the time, you know, being sort of an encapsulated mm -hmm. environment down, you know, in Alabama. But once I found out, you know, once I started looking at quantum physics, quantum mechanics, you know, and these whole, this whole quantum field theory, you know, quantum mm -hmm. entanglement, sure. you know, you know uh, the things existing as a particle in a wave and depends on who's, when you're looking at it or who's looking at it, whether it exists as a particle or a wave. You know, these things really kind of, kind of, kind of got me started. I'm like, wow, you know, why isn't there something similar going on in life sciences, in biology? Mm -hmm. Why isn't there some similar underlying mechanism that connects maybe all living things? So when these studies are coming out and I'm looking at AMPK and I'm looking at its efficacious results when you activate it in several different disease states, and I'm looking at these plant-based compounds, that are activating AMPK. And I'm noticing as well is that these plant-based compounds can't, these plants aren't producing these compounds to help us live longer purposely. Right. You know, I mean, you know the, the, the French lilac, you know, is not producing the precursor to metformin to help us decrease hepatic gluconeogenesis and, you know, slow down aging. It's probably producing it to protect itself. Mm -hmm. And these compounds, you know, are to smaller organisms that are natural predators of these plants, they are really toxic and probably to the point that it wards them off or kills them. But for humans and human cells, they are just the right amount of stress to kick those cells into gear to cause them to do what they were designed to do that much better. And here is the underlying you know, link. I'm thinking that maybe this governs all everything that we consider to be alive. Because I'm seeing this stress uh, interconnectedness, not only in eukaryotes, but also in prokaryotes as well, mm -hmm. in bacteria as well. And, we, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. You know, some of the antibiotics, a, a bacterial genus called streptomyces. Mm -hmm. uh, 
extremely important. Almost 70% of our clinical useful antibiotics come from streptomyces. Mm -hmm. What causes streptomyces to produce more antibiotics is stress. You stress that bacteria, you take away its uh, nutrients, its food source, you heat stress, a uh, little osmotic stress, put some sorbitol on there. You put it in the same environment uh, as its natural predator. Mm -hmm. It starts pumping out more antibiotics, more antimicrobials. So you stress that bacteria, and guess what? It became stronger. And it displayed its strength by producing antibiotics, which in turn stress and likely ward off and kill other predators. So this was a huge, huge thing for me. And I'm thinking this thing that we call life is really about, you know, stressing cells, a challenge, you know, leading to, you know, causing those cells to do that, to do what they were designed to do that much better. Sure. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm also in grad school and I'm done with grad school. And uh, I think back to patents and intellectual property. And I'm thinking how important, you know, patents were. And so I decided to make the leap and go to law school. And I went to the University of Houston Law School and mm -hmm. uh, sort of I specialized in uh, pharma, biotech patents. And uh, graduated, got licensed, and uh, you know, got licensed before the USPTO as well, United States Patent and Trademark Office to prosecute patents. And this is where the interesting connection with you know, Einstein, and, and by the way, I'm nowhere near you know, Einstein. And I, can, I, can, I can never feel that that they got shoes. But as a patent attorney, what, what, what you're experiencing is, is that you're, you're actually getting all of the, 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 the inventions, all of the ideas, you know, from, from an inventor, if you're working from a company, and you're receiving those ideas from all over the place. You're receiving them from several different, you know, therapeutic fields. So you're getting a, exactly, you're getting a patent application where you're getting an invention from neuroscientists, metabolism, immunology, and you're, you have to assimilate the, those things and you have to prosecute a patent. Well, in order to do that, you've got to look into the background. You may have taken right. a couple of classes, but you have to get, to get up to speed on it. Right. So, you, so here I am, I'm being hit from every different angle about all different you know, areas of physiology. And what I am noticing is that same thing, being, uh, the same recurring theme over and over again. There's yeah. quick question. No, no, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. The, uh, <laughs> I, 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 it sounded I, like maybe you had, you had a quick question or something. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't want to interrupt you. I because I, because I, I want to get into the next part of the story, and we have, I have a lot of time, and I, I want to hear all of this. But you, you juggle something in my own mind, um, and I just wanted to sort of take a quick deviation there because you know I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going through your, your path now, and now you're in the patent office. Uh, you've, you've done your degrees, and you, as you said, you are uh, inundated by uh, literally, and, and it's always been amazing to me. I'm, I am a, uh, I'm a pharmacist by undergraduate degree that went to business oh. school, and I'm, I'm a business development guy. I'm not a, I'm not a patent guy. I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I always was amazed by sort of, um, you know, <laughs> aside from. Folks like you, your day job in writing patents, but at the same time, you are taking literally the history of, of science, biomedical science, millions of patents, uh, millions of scientific papers, and having to create something out of that. And it's always, you know, two things amaze me. One, whenever I was involved in uh, a company that was filing patents, how there was invariably, you know, some weird discovery from 1942 that, <laughs> that interfered with our claims, all right? At the same time, I was always amazed by um, the ability of a good patent attorney to actually find um, the way to create those claims because of all the stuff that existed from the, over the last hundred years. And so, you know, I, I was, and I, I, this is sort of a, a rhetorical question in a sense, but like in many ways with all of that information out there and some of the things you're talking about that, you know, you're, you're taking pieces of it now, you have these skills, these three major skills, business, science, and law. Do you really need a lab anymore? I mean, I mean, you have so much that you can play with. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, sorry, there's not really a question there per se, but I wanted to sort of like link that because I want to, I'll, 
after that, I'm going to ask you about your discoveries. But it really is, uh, in 2019, quite fascinating that we still need to play around in the lab when we have so much that's already been done, but maybe not translated yet. Right, exactly. And in 2019, and with the advent of the internet and access to these journal articles, which you did, which I didn't have growing up, you know, and, and yeah. which, you know, researchers didn't have before, you have access to so much information. And, and, and it's really interesting, you know, you said, do you really even need a lab? And I actually, I think maybe, you know, in, in, in some sense, that having a lab and having a specialty Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, an, I'm a neurologist, I'm a virologist, I'm a cancer biologist, may in some respects be somewhat of a hindrance because it's very interesting. I speak, I've spoken with HIV researchers, I've spoken with, you know, fertility researchers, and I'm asking them, do you realize that there's a compound called ionomyosin? It's a calcium ionophore, it increases calcium levels in a cell. Do you realize, I'm telling the HIV researchers, that you're using the same compounds as a control to reactivate latent HIV as fertility specialists are using to activate a human egg to create human life. Mm -hmm. I was like, do you really? Uh, and what's interesting is that, you know, uh, some of the researchers are such in their silos that, you know, they don't even have, uh, they don't even have the opportunity to look over the therapeutic wall and to see what the other guy is doing. And, all these, uh, and if only they had to look, maybe they would see that, wow, a, a, a T cell that has HIV asleep in it, basically dormant, is very much similar, almost the same as a human egg that's suspended in meiosis II that's waiting to be activated to create human life. And they're using the same compound to do both. And that's really interesting. And, I, and what's funny is that when I first ran across that, and that this sort of jumps into a my um, old site activation, you know, very similar to HIV reactivation. Mm -hmm. What I found out was that uh, nobody really said what ionomyosin was. They said, okay, yeah, it's a calcium ionophore. But yeah, that's sort of, you're, you're telling me the mechanism, you're, you're telling me what it is based on, you know, sort of what it does when you apply it to a particular cell. So mm -hmm. take, for instance, metformin. Before they knew how it worked, they said, okay, you know, what's the mechanism of action metformin? People say, well, it decreases the hepatic gluconeogenesis. Well, that's what happens when you give it to a type 2 diabetic patient. That's what you're going to see. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily its mechanism of action. Oh, great. So I had to actually do some research and find out what ionomycin is. Ionomycin, and we just talked about this, it's a very weak antibiotic produced by Streptomyces. Mm -hmm. It's a bacterial product. A product from a bacterium can actually stress and slightly activate a T cell infected with latent HIV and wake it up and cause the immune system to see it and potentially attack it and kill it. That same product can slightly stress a human egg, causing that egg to wake up and begin to cleave as if it had been fertilized by a sperm, which is an in, the indispensable process for the creation of all human life. Mm -hmm. All human beings alive today and all human beings that have ever lived began their existence as an activated oocyte. Mm -hmm. And what can activate an oocyte, obviously sperm, but ionomyosin, a, a, an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Puromyosin is a protein synthesis inhibitor, also produced by streptomyces. You know, they produce this to shut down other bacteria and other organisms. It activates a human oocyte. Ethanol, you know, many people are familiar with ethanol, activates a human oocyte. Uh, electrical stimulation. Mm -hmm. can a human oocyte. What do all of these things have in common? They're stressors. They're slight stressors. They increase the levels of calcium and or another big one too, ROS, reactive oxygen species. You know, people commonly know it, know it as free radicals. Mm -hmm. and people always also commonly assume free radicals to be bad or ROS to be bad. That is very, very much not the case. Right. It's all about how much and for how long. And we're going to get into that as well. Even in an activated uh, egg, in an activated mouse egg, which are, which are basically uh, models for human eggs, of course, calcium wakes up that egg, but ROS is increased immediately after or on oocyte activation. And also calcium potentiates ROS release from the mitochondria, from NADPH oxidases, 
and ROS in turn increases calcium release from the endoparasitic reticulum. There's a nice little feedback mechanism going on. Whenever you see one, you're going to see the other. In human follicular fluids, in women, uh, if there's a, ben there's a beneficial level of ROS in that follicular fluid that's associated with an increased rate of fertilization. You need ROS and calcium in the right levels for the right amount of time in order to create human life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ROS, of course, and calcium also reactivates latent HIV, but ROS also reactivates latent HIV, which basically what I proposed and some of new abstracts from uh, Johns Hopkins University have also presented evidence showing that, and they have to be published, but it's at a conference. You know, at JHU, you know, uh, the, the undergraduate or graduate student from uh, uh, Siliciano's lab showed that, yeah, when we put a ROS-inducing agent on these cells, HIV woke up, and these cells were from HIV patients. It mm -hmm. reactivated HIV. What they also showed was that an NRF2 agonist, and NRF2 is basically what our major antioxidant a transcription factor present in the cell. Mm -hmm. So NRF2, you know, activates a lot of transcription of antioxidant genes. So heme oxygenase 1, NQ01. And sephorophane activates NRF2. Sephorophane comes from broccoli, comes mm -hmm. from broccoli, broccoli sprouts. So in fluorophane has also been shown to increase what? ROS. So they put a they, the reactive oxygen species. So they put a little sephorophane on a T cell infected with HIV from a human patient, that HIV woke up in that particular C cell. And that's very important because as long as that HIV is asleep, the immune system can't detect it, it can't see it, it can't kill it. But once you wake it up, ah, there you are. Now I see you, now I can finally kill you. And interestingly, ROS and calcium and AMPK are also necessary to wake up immune cells in a person's body that are exhausted from fighting HIV or cancer. And they are necessary to wake up those immune cells, cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells. If you knock out AMPK, they die when you try to activate CD4 positive T cells. Mm. Uh, if you knock out AMPK in vivo in rodent models, you get a, a significantly inhibited response, immune response to both viruses and bacteria. This is all about stress. ROS and calcium and increases in the AMP to ATP ratio, each of which activates AMPK, is absolutely critical for the creation of human life and uh, the, the inhibition of viral infections. Metformin was recently shown to inhibit dengue virus, Zika virus, Legionella pneumophilia, which is a bacteria that causes Legionnaire's disease, yeah, and also malaria. How does metformin do all of those different things? Kill those viruses, bacteria, excuse me, pathogens. You know, AMPK is, 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 most, is most certainly a, 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 a critical for oocyte or for your, uh, resumption of meiosis and oocyte. How does that all work? It comes back to those, uh, to those fantasy films that I was watching. It comes back to Yoda. There is something that links all living things. And, and all cellular processes that are associated with living things. And, and interesting, rapamycin, just like iolomycin comes from streptomyces, what does rapamycin come from? Streptomyces. Mm -hmm. And rapamycin, and for some people who may not know what rapamycin is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a compound. It's a, originally uh, was, was, was thought of as an antifungal, sort of antimicrobial compound. And it comes from a, a Streptomyces, how do you get streptomyces to produce more rapamycin? You stress it, mm -hmm. put a little UV radiation on it. And what this bacterial genus, where, where does streptomyces, uh, rapamycin, I'm sorry, come from? Easter Island. Easter Island, yep. And Easter Island is what, uh, what type of island or what kind of island did it used to be? A volcanic island, a very stressful place. What uh, Darwin, the Galapagos Island, that's a volcanic island. What do you see in these islands, of the Hawaiian islands, volcanic islands? A high amount of speciation, these rich diversity of species that's going on. Mm -hmm. That's a very stressful environment. You have volcanic eruptions, you got lava, you got ash, you got oxidative you know, atmosphere going on. What is that doing to these organisms? It is stressing those organisms, and sure enough, a lot of them are gonna die. 
but the ones who survive are much, much stronger. And they, it sort of produces better, stronger species. And th this goes to another one of my papers as well about jumping genes. Where do you mm -hmm. see a lot of jumping genes going on? Right. In stressful environments, in those volcanic islands. You know, so this is where I'm thinking. And, and as you can see, my mind is going like all over the place. And it's, it's, it's truly amazing. And I, I love listening to way you think, uh, because you're not just, and, and you know, I, I throw off my big pharma hat. <laughs> I, I, I say that big pharma was my employer 20 years ago, but you, you are truly uh, systems thinking because you are not just bringing in, you know, although, you know, we're talking about metformin, which as you said, you know, originally a natural product discovered back in 1922, uh, been around and you know you're bringing in other natural products like rapamycin resveratrol you're making a connection to um uh, and i might term it all but sort of sort of the bi certain bioelectrical components of our physiology and then of course into um what i'll call uh, uh induced evolutionary type dynamics mm -hmm. hormesis uh you know we, we had somebody actually a few weeks back talking about different forms of hormesis, right, right. including neurohormesis and, you know, some of the things you're talking about with regard to physical stresses, but also the importance of mental stresses, although we, we typically hear, you know, stay away from, you know, stressful situations, but no, even yeah. some mental stress is good for us. We don't want to be, you know, and Mike Tyson, you know, you don't want to, you know, fear to overtake you, but you need some yeah. fear, so you learn to fight back. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I completely appreciate Sort of the systems approach and the thinking that you're taking. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to ask, what's the next step? Where are you going with all this? As a patent attorney, <laughs> you might want to tell, tell me, tell us to come as the audience to come back in in a few uh, months and read the patents. But um, can you take us a few steps further? Because I'm sitting on the edge of my seat here. <laughs> I want to hear more, but if we can't talk more, that's okay. I'll have you back on another episode. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I do have some. I do have a few irons in the fire that's okay. going on. So, you know, uh, some of it's, uh, some of it's business related, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, I kind of, you know, you know, want to remain sort of uh, a little bit that's tight fine. on, you know, some of the other things, but that's fine. What, yeah. What it, you know, as far as, uh, you know, with the intellectual property and it, as far as the, uh, with the publications and everything, and it, it takes, unfortunately, it takes sometimes a while for sure. hypothesis to be substantiated. You know, it could take years. So with my publication on Progeria, you know, I started working on it, uh, you know, really on the ideas and the research really in 2009. And what got me into that was um, uh, that year, metformin was shown to, for the first time, to inhibit and kill cancer stem cells. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that, that, that was it for me. I'm like, okay, uh, enough is enough. I've seen way too much. I have to get into this some type of way because everybody's i think a lot of people is, are missing the interconnection the interconnectedness this underlying theme that ross and calcium and stress is playing a beneficial role in all these particular parts and you look at cancer stem cells you know there are cells that actually resemble embryonic stem cells and mm -hmm. stem cells cancer stem cells can self-renew they can produce more of each other but they also can differentiate Right. into, uh, 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 you know, progenitor cancer cells and fully differentiated. Well, so can embryonic stem cells as well. And just like adult stem cells, cancer stem cells can also, uh, you know, exit the cell cycle and become quiescent, right. uh, which is huge. But one thing that the literature shows that, you know, it's pretty convincing is that cellular stress causes adult stem cells basically to wake up and begin to differentiate and replenish cells in the organ that it resides in, which makes sense you know if you have damage to your muscle cells you know you want some some of your satellites themselves to wake up and start to produce more differentiated cells the same thing with the brain right. you know if you have brain damage you would want some of your stem cells in your your subventricular zone and your ditch gyrus you know to wake up and start producing more cells and start to begin that repair well interestingly a study showed also that Ross and calcium also promote embryonic stem cell differentiation in order to form the three germ layers that eventually make the baby, the meso, endo, and ectoderm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and also a study after that showed that AMPK is really critical, if not indispensable, for embryonic stem cell differentiation. So I said, put it together, ROS, calcium, AMPK, embryonic stem cell differentiation. ROS, calcium, AMPK, adult stem cell differentiation. Metformin, it works wonders, and it works really, some really does some amazing things in cancer stem cells from the deadliest of cancers, glioblastoma, pancreatic. Cancer stem cells look like embryonic and adult stem cells. Metformin increases ROS, calcium, AMP to AP, ATP ratio. It's going to differentiate those cancer stem cells, mm -hmm. causing those stems, causing that differentiation, making them more susceptible to radiation and chemotherapy, or hopefully just apoptosis mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. So I said, these are the same things. You know, this underlying theory of stress. Stress wakes up the human egg. Stress wakes up and causes a differentiation of cancer stem cells, adult stem cells, embryonic stem cells, sleeping HIV. Mm -hmm. And that was what pushed me into progeria because I was looking, I was very fascinated, like many people were at the time, on aging. You know, right. I wanted to slow it down. You know, I hate my gray hairs that are coming in now and stuff. And, you know, I'm still working on you know, a way to try to reverse that. I don't think I'm going to be successful in my lifetime. <laughs> who knows? Who, who knows? But I'm looking at aging and I'm looking at progeria and I'm thinking, again, intuitively. And it's interesting. I uh, read a quote by Einstein. I think by Einstein. You know, there's so many quotes out there. But he was saying, you know, that intelligence is secondary to intuition. Mm -hmm. And usually... That's what I'm using from early on. I mean, it came from like sci-fi movies and everything else, but intuitively I'm like, okay, you know, you have this disease, you know, you have certain people that age much more rapidly than others, you know, same age chronologically, but one looks a lot older than others. Mm -hmm. you know, certain things that people intuitively say that can help you feel better and look better, exercise, eating fruits and vegetables, this, this, and that. Could this actually play a role in possibly alleviating some of these aging defects in hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome. So I, look, I uh, purposely sought out the only, you know, real world, you know, the only uh, human model of accelerate, accelerated aging that I could find, which was progeria. Mm -hmm. And of course, doing like a patent attorney should, you know, when you run into this type of stuff and it's all about genes and gene splicing, you got to do the background work. And that's where my intellectual property background really came into play. And mm -hmm. going into it, you know, learn is, learn what you need to learn about it, but not so much so that you can get a PhD in it, right. you know, because if you do that, you know, you're going to become pigeonholed and, you know, siloed. And actually that's going to sort of start to influence your way of thinking and prevents you from making connections, you know, across the board. So I learned enough about it and really found out that, and this is the kicker that, Humans, that regular non non progeria humans, you and I that don't have progeria, we produce the same toxic protein that progeria kids produce that causes them to uh, accelerate or causes them to age much more rapidly mm -hmm. you know, than we do. We produce the same toxic protein, and it's called progeria, mm -hmm. and we produce it by the same method that they produce, which is uh, basically. Uh, alternative gene splicing or the activation of a cryptic splice site. Okay. Then I started thinking, okay, if we produce it and it starts to accumulate slowly, you know, as we get older and we age much more slowly, and there are certain things that researchers are showing that could possibly slow down aging, could compounds that activate AMPK, like metformin, could this potentially decrease this top, the level of the toxic protein and slow down the aging defects, at least cellularly, in progeria kids. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. I proposed it in 2014. I said, right. you know what? Yeah, you know what? I'm like, okay, you know, progeria kids have this laminate gene that helps the nucleus in the cell, you know, stay rounded. And, but the, this gene is cut in a particular place. So the, the cut gene makes a truncated protein. And the, pro, you know, the protein is kind of short. It's, it's basically too short to do its job. So that causes all kind of bad things to happen in the nucleus, you know, DNA transcription and everything. Everything goes haywire. The nucleus becomes all blobby. But we cut our gene just in the right spot so we could make a normal length gene. So I'm thinking, okay, you know, if cellular stress, and I'm bringing in stress and ROS as the underlying, it's, it's, it's almost like cheating. 
It's kind of like a puzzle. It's like, uh, I know what the picture looks like, you know, because I've seen it and all I have to do is put the pieces together. Somebody else who hasn't seen the, the picture at all, you just give them some pieces of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. They may put it together, they may not. And it mm -hmm. may take them, you know, a really long time to put those pieces together. So I, I have the picture. The picture is stress, Ross, calcium A and PK activation. The only thing that I have to do is find out where it's operating at. Right. Excuse me. And it's operating on several different levels in progeria cells. And what I focused on was gene splicing. I said that stress, I think, beneficial levels of stress can actually alter uh, the splice site selection, the place where your splicing machinery sits down on that gene. Instead of sitting on this cryptic splice site, you know, I propose that you know, cellular stress via metformin and AAPK can cause it to sit on the canonical splice site, you know, the normal splice site, more so than the cryptic, and can produce more normal protein and increase the ratio of normal to abnormal protein. Okay. Less progerian, more normal. And that's really, you know, that's a really far out thing to say because gene splicing itself is super complicated. Right, you know, yeah. Dr. Discovery won a Nobel Prize for it in the early 90s. Right. And what I'm saying is that, you know what, this compound that comes from French lilac, you know, that activates AMPK, that works by stress, it can alter gene splicing. You know, and I'm saying that it can do so, and it will lower progerian levels, and it will alter the splicing ratio. And also, I propose, first propose as well, that, you know, autophagy is probably going to be also implicated in this as well, because AMPK had been shown to be a uh, a primary regulator, autophagy, and autophagy is basically you know, the garbage disposal system, getting rid of these bad proteins. Yes. So I said that in 2014, and there's a particular, and not to get too, 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 too detailed, but the splicing machinery sits down on that gene, but there's also something similar to a, a foreman in a construction crew. You know, the foreman tells the construction crew, hey, sit right there, right. start working here. So we have the same thing in cells. So what prior research has shown is that when you have too much of this particular foreman called SRFF1, SRSF1, mm. you know, it causes that machinery to sit down on that cryptic splice site way too much. So I said, hey, you activate AMPK, give them that foreman, it'll decrease the activity of that foreman, SRSF1, alter the splice site selection, and decrease progerian and lower aging defects. And sure enough, two years later, that's exactly what a French team found. They put metformin on there, uh, exposed metformin to those progeria cells. It all it decreased the mRNA and protein levels of SRSF1. It also decreased progeria levels, the toxic levels. It also helped to create the uh, correct the uh, nuclear architecture. And that's exactly what I propose. Interestingly, they did not test for AMPK. I, I wonder why, because metformin's primary mechanism of action is AMPK. Okay. But, you know, luckily, uh, just a few months later, some Japanese researchers confirmed those results. And they also they said, yeah, metformin does all those things that their prior study does, but it also activates AMPK in these progerious cells. So you see kind of where my thought process comes in when I am attacking a particular disease state. It, it's, it's elegant and... Um... I don't know, the beauty, I, I, I'm just appreciating the beauty of it that, you know, almost 100 years after the discovery of this thing, and this, you know, obviously metformin, but you're looking at other substances as well, but 100 years later, I mean, it's sort of like aspirin, right? I mean, they're still figuring out what's going on, and you're figuring out things and, and sort of, <laughs> you know, um, scooping <laughs> teams by using your mind and, well, and, and, and I think it's, it's 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 what this show is all about and it's a beautiful story I, I, I just love listen to it yeah it's it's kind of interesting and funny because I'm thinking about the researchers that you know finally showed that and they were kind of like and I know they're aware of my study because right. my my study was the only thing on PubMed saying that metformin and AMPK can lower progerin levels you know? I just can, I just imagine you know somebody like discovers this and then they file their patent, and they're like, hey, there's this Finley guy that already wrote about this. <laughs> but <laughs> Exactly. So I, I can empathize with them, but then again, you know. They're going to come to you, though. Hey, so. yeah, hey, hey. 
I get it. It's, it's elegant and I, and uh, it makes a lot. I mean, I, I really appreciate it. It's, um, it's yeah, it's really so. I mean, and it very and it, and what's interesting is that they showed that AMPK. And what's also interesting is that indirectly, must that initial study proposed that uh, metformin and AMPK can alter gene splicing in in vivo in humans. Mm -hmm. Nobody had really said that. And sure enough, during that intervening time between 2014 and 2016, a team showed that AMPK, well, metformin and AMPK can also beneficially affect gene splicing mm -hmm. in a disease called myotonic dystrophy type 1, which is a basically a muscle wasting disease that's right. associated with uh, faulty gene splicing. But they also showed that metformin beneficially affects gene splicing in normal human diabetic patients, right. which is indirectly what my paper proposed. And the way that they showed it is this, the, uh, they gave the diabetic patients metformin and they tested for insulin receptor. The insulin receptor gene has uh, two different splice isoforms, sort of a good one and not so good. So they gave them metformin, the good, the good splicing isoform was increased. Mm -hmm. Then they took them off metformin and put them on another drug that doesn't affect splicing. That good splicing isoform went down. Mm -hmm. but they, then they took them off that drug, put them back on metformin. That good splicing factor went right back up again. Metformin is, is beneficially affecting gene splicing, which is this huge complicated process in vivo in humans. Sure. That is, you know, that is, uh, that's a really, really, really big thing. And, you know, what's, what's also interesting is that uh, in 2011, we talked about rapamycin. You know, rapamycin, you know, was shown to, you know, do very much similar things as metformin in progeria cells. Right. So basically decrease, you know, the level of toxic protein. And they did, and rapamycin did it by autophagy, basically. That's what the research was focused on. That came out of the NIH. Yeah. So recently, Rapamycin has been shown to activate AMPK in vivo hmm. in, in normal rodents, in normal rats. Now, think about this. Most people associate rapamycin as an mTOR inhibitor, which it is. Mm -hmm. But in some of my latest papers, I sort of gently <laughs> propose that rapamycin is also a cellular stress inducer. Uh -huh. and it, it, it activates AMPK by inhibiting mTOR. And I propose that if you mm -hmm. inhibit AMPK, many of the beneficial effects that you see in rapamycin in several different disease states won't be manifested. Nice. A lot of it's, and I think a lot of it's uh, activity is coming from AMPK. And you think about it, you know, mTOR regulates mRNA translation and protein synthesis. Right. You know, that's one of the most energy intensive processes in sure. this cell. What's going to happen when you inhibit mRNA translation and protein synthesis? Huge red flag. Stress, stress, stress. stress. This cell is under major stress. And we, what, we, what have we been talking about the whole time? Stress, stress. APK. Metformin, I mean, I'm sorry, rapamycin is a cellular stress inducer. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a huge cellular stress inducer. And it's associated with some side effects as well that comes sure. along with it. So rapamycin is an AMPK, and, and this is another interesting point too. It got rid of those toxic proteins by inducing autophagy. Yeah. Well, another studies have shown that rapamycin, you know, ability to activate autophagy is based on calcium increases. The, this, that, there's that stressor. If mm -hmm. you chelate calcium, you don't get autophagy induction. So it needs to increase calcium and also, it increases ROS. And look at this. There is another study shown by Tim Sirolimus. That's a derivative of MAP rapamycin. Mm -hmm. It basically looks like rapamycin. And it also helped to create, uh, create uh, aging defects in progeria cells. Okay. And guess what uh, Tim Sirolimus did in the first hour of treatment when it was placed on those progeria cells? It increased ROS levels. It increased superoxide anions. Progeria cells are known to be under oxidative stress. Why would a compound that it's eventually effective, in the, but in the beginning, it increases ROS, increases superoxide. A little bit of bad equals a whole lot of good. 
Like, That's exactly what happened. It stressed that cell just a little bit right in the first hour of treatment. And interestingly, the researchers kind of didn't know how to really explain it. You know, it's like, well, we saw this and, you know, maybe Timsorolus is some type of toxin or something. And they would be right. You know, it's a temporary toxin. And what they saw on the growth curve was actually a decrease in the proliferation rate during that first, you know, during those first couple of hours of treatment. You know, it sort of dipped down and then all of a sudden, you know, it went right back up, mm -hmm. you know, almost paralleling control cells, uh, almost, you know, paralleling other cells. So what happened is that when you put that Timsorolums, that rapamycin derivative on the progeria cell, you stressed it, you increased ROS, and you kicked it in the rear and, you know, you caused it to do what it was designed to do. You basically sort of woke it up, you know, from being presenescent or senescent and caused yeah. it to proliferate more. So rapamycin needs calcium to induce autophagy to get rid of uh, uh, toxic proteins, progerium, which was shown by the NIH. Timosorolimus, a rapamycin derivative, increases loss in progeria cells. That means that rapamycin is a cellular stressor mm -hmm. and, it, and it activates autophagy by increasing loss and calcium. It's fascinating. It's really that, fascinating. That is, as you can see, I had the same expression that you had when I saw the study and I put those two things together. I'm like, wait a minute. People always say rapamycin mTOR, rapamycin mTOR inhibitor. Yes, mTOR inhibitor, but uh, uh, mTOR regulates protein synthesis and mRNA translation. You're inhibiting that. That's a huge stress, cellular right. stress inducer. That's a massive cellular stress inducer. It's fascinating. And, yeah, and it's activating AMPK. You know, and, and of course, rapamycin comes from bugs, and they produce it. They produce it to protect themselves, and That's you know. Reason. Yeah, yeah, it's for a reason. It's actually, it's, it's for, you know, for a reason. So that's what I'm, you know, I'm looking at this information. Yeah. I'm putting this, you know, these things together like that. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, it's elegant. And, you know, I'm going to say after the show is done, I'm going to link to a lot of your stuff so people sure, can sure, read. Sure. Uh, so you don't have to give it all, give it all away here. <laughs> I, I, wanted, I wanted, while I had you, though, I, I did want to tap your brain about something else. Um, because you obviously are a fountain of of scientific knowledge. I, I want to come back though to a patent question um, real fast. Uh, we're not real fast, we can take our time with this one too. Um, you know, in a, in a discussion, you know, we were talking about um, sort of a lot of repurposing in the sense, you know, rapamycin discovered 100 years, I mean, sorry, metformin discovered 100 years ago. Uh, you know, one of the big issues with rapamycin and some of the anti-aging clinical studies they're doing is, no one wants to fund it because it's a generic and all this business. Um, I'm less concerned about that sort of coming out of pharma because I know there's always interesting ways to, to patent delivery vehicles and so forth. But I want your opinion on a related topic. Um, as we're moving forward in 2019 and beyond, um, we're seeing a lot of pharmacotherapeutic stuff coming down the pipeline that doesn't look like the drugs of yesterday. So they're not small molecules, they're not uh, defined proteins. Um, they're different. Um, and when I say different, um, I'm talking about uh, microbiome cocktails. I'm talking about some of the stuff that's going on at uh, my old employer at GSK, where they're looking at you know, electroceuticals and electrical impulses that cause pharmacologic effects. Uh, talking about um, just you know, a range of things that are not discreet, like the drugs of yesterday. What is your view on uh, the future of patents in these con in the context of weird-looking therapeutic interventions? And is the concept of the um, the trade secret, a la Coca-Cola and so forth? Um, going to make, sort of rear its head because you know thinking about some of the things you're talking about putting the drugs aside for a minute there's also a lot of technique involved let's say uh it's probably more than you know let's just give this rapamycin and, and we have this effect there's probably unique pulsing and time chronobiology and all this stuff that i just like your opinion on sort of what the future holds in terms of how we get intellectual properties built around some of these things that are not 
traditional drugs or not traditional new chemical entities? And I'll let you run with that one. Right. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question because, uh, you know, they're coming up with some really interesting drugs and really interesting techniques uh, 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 to, to provide therapeutics. And as far as intellectual property is, uh, is, is, is concerned, uh, you know, there are different ways to kind of, you know, craft these uh, claims, you know, in order to, uh, you know, to, to protect your compounds. Um, and you can craft those claims, you know, fairly broadly. You know, I think you definitely get into an issue when you're talking about using organisms and, and things like that. Right. To, to, you know, to basically make your drugs and, you know, try to patent those, patent those things, you know, in that particular respect. Right. So, you know, trade secrets, you know, that, you know, definitely come into, you know, come into play as well when you're talking about these particular drugs. But uh, as far as uh, the, 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 the IP issues are concerned with it, you know, I don't see too much of an issue, uh, you know, with IP and as far as uh, drafting claims to protect these particular inventions. Uh, you know, you talk about the microbiome mm -hmm. and things like that. So, you know, there's a variety of different things that you know, researchers can do that, you know, uh, you know, patent practitioners can also do as well to kind of sort of work their way around, you know, different claims and things right. like that. Uh, you know, you're starting to see medical devices, you know, yeah. more intricate medical devices starting to come into play. You know, one thought drop, you know, kind of hits, you know, uh, at the forefront is, uh, you know, transcranial magnetic stimulation, you right, know, right, right. which is, you know, kind of a, becoming a big thing right now and, you know, using a, uh, electrical current creating magnetic fields to you know to affect um uh, cellular processes right so you know it, people can get very creative with patents and, and you know i really don't see a tightening of the belt with the intellectual property when it, when, when it comes to that now when it comes to organisms and sort of getting very close to you know patenting you know genes naturally occurring you know things that you know occur in organisms mm -hmm. Uh, there may be some types of issues coming on. Right. Patent, you know, patent office usually traditionally, you know, kind of frowns on, you know, you know things of that sort. Right. But, you know, the microbiome, the whole CRISPR-Cas thing that's going yeah. on, you know, you know, that's been, you know, heavily, heavily in the news and stuff. And, and you know, interestingly, the thing about CRISPR-Cas, you know, they're using components from bacteria, right? We right. talked a lot about, you know, we talked a lot about bacteria. And one of the bacteria, bacteria that they use is Streptococcus pyogenes. You know, they use, you know, CRISPR, and they also use the Cas, you know, 9, which is sort of the nuclease that cuts up the genes or whatever. And it's shown fantastic results, uh, you know, in vitro, and, you know, in a lot of animal models as well. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's you know, kind of like with RNA inf interference was first came about and stuff, you know. Sure. That hasn't been, you know, really capitalized on, no. you know. You know, especially, you know, the, from the inventors, from the guys who discovered it and won the Nobel. So, you know, I think that's kind of left up to be, yeah. you know, left up to chance. But, you know, the, the of course, the patent office, you know, recently granted some patents to, uh, to I think it was UC Berkeley. You know, yeah. they, UC and Harvard had a, you know, this whole battle going on. But what's interesting about that, uh, and I'm sorry, getting back, you know, just a little bit back to the biology is that it comes from bacteria. And it's, it's, it's the bacterium's basically immune system. Right. And... What jumped out at me was interesting is that our own immune system we just talked about it is activated by stress. Yeah. You know, T cells and stress and stuff. And I'm like, this is the bacterium's immune system. Is it also activated by stress? Well, any CRISPR Cas research will tell you, well, the CRISPR Cas systems are activated by phage infection. A phage mm -hmm. is basically a virus. Sure. Well, sure enough, if you do a little poking around, you would find out that CRISPR Cas systems are also activated by heat stress. They're also activated by uh, envelope stress. They're mm -hmm. also activated by nutrient deprivation. Uh, these are, what are all of these things associated with? These are stress. Yeah. The very thing, CRISPR-Cas, the very thing that's got the world, the biological world lit, is tied into cellular stress. Yeah. You know, it's funny, I, I don't know if you saw it, but the, um, and it has both the cellular stress component mm -hmm. and the IP uh, mm -hmm. thing. The, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there was this big uh, uh, article, I think it was in Stat, about, you know, Merck, right, still makes this tuberculosis vaccine for bladder cancer. Mm -hmm. It's been around since the 1800s. <laughs> it's old. There's no IP, but it's, you know, they're the only one. You know, Sanofi had to close up their 
factory because it was contaminated with you know, it's a live vaccine and it's not a it's not a you know, a toxic agent it is a chemo sensitizer or whatever it does in the bladder uh to stress you know and so the you know the innate immune response kills off some some of your tumors but it's another one of those i uh, just know uh, you, you had me thinking about stress but at the same time christ you know there's no intellectual property here there hasn't been for decades yet Merck still has a monopoly on this thing <laughs> they're the only ones that make it uh, anywhere in the world and so right and you know definitely uh, you know trade secrets you know yeah. all you know a lot of stuff you know comes into play it's kind of yeah. like you know coca-cola is like yeah, okay, yeah pre I, the other one that I was thinking about is Premarin because you know uh. My mom, my uh, my wife would slap me in the head. She started taking it recently. <laughs> but I mean, I looked at that. I mean, that was, why have put it on the market back in the '40s? It had, it's never had, you know, never had a generic competitor. And I always, you know, at uh, cocktail parties, I'll be like, "What's the most, you know, widely sold branded prescription drug ever?" And it's Premarin. It's not Lipitor. It's not any of that stuff. They've never fight. Well, it's it's now Pfizer, but they've never had a generic competitor to the thing. But it's been off patent for. Yeah, decades it's just wow. one of those wild things but yeah. sorry sorry to have any of that no. anyway no, that's, that's yeah. really interesting yeah i've never yeah i've yeah, never heard of that yeah, yeah it's super interesting, interesting. Yeah, but the but, um, the, you know, positioning is is it, 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 i mean it can get tricky because i mean you look at you know everything that we've been talking about you know and that performs these really great things these really eff efficacious things and you know they're pretty much safe you know they can't be patented in their original form. Right. So going back to your question about metformin, you know, getting the money, you know, and I think of Barzillai at uh, Albert Einstein, you right. know, the team child and stuff, you know, and there's been some, I, I think I've read been some issues about, you know, you know, him basically trying to get the money together to fund yeah. the clinical trials. And why wouldn't a drug company be interested in that? Well, you know, obvious reason, you know, metformin is, you know, generic. And, you know, that's, you know, it, it, it definitely plays a part, you know, and some of these naturally occurring compounds that are super efficacious, really safe and stuff, uh, in their original forms, they can't be patented because anything that, you know, occurs naturally, you know, can't be patented by the patent and trademark law. So you have to derivatize it in some type of way. Right. In order to, you know, create some type of financial incentive, you know, for, you know, a commercial entity to really sort of put their backing, financial backing on it. Right. You know? Sort of, uh, uh, you know, I, was, I always wonder why they didn't just combine. I mean, combine it with something um, innocuous, or you know, right. it had some other effect. Combine it, make a new sort of combination uh, drug master file, and then go in. The, I, I mean, just you're yeah, the, yeah, those, you're those the expert, some, but those, those um, are my ideas. I've always wondered about that, right. and actually, that sort of brings to mind, uh, you know, uh, another drug too, uh, which is works. Hugely, and this goes back to one of my papers. is is so important, uh, and uh, you know, I think you know, uh, you know, I sent you something on that. And it, that drug is a uh, propofol. You know, the anesthetic yeah. drug. Yeah, that they use that to put people to sleep. And yeah. of course, you know, uh, you know, that's not you know, uh, you know, there's no uh, uh, you know, extra property on it or anything like that. So, you know, and that, and thankfully, thankfully, that's you know, that's a very, very, very good thing because propofol is so important that. You know, it changed the face, basically changed the practice of anesthesiology, revolutionized yeah. anesthesiology. And uh, actually, the guy who discovered propofol, uh, uh, Dr. Glenn, he won the Alaska Award uh, last year, as a matter of fact, for his discovery. And Alaska Award, pretty prestigious. A lot of Alaska Awards want to go on to win the Nobel Prize. But uh, interestingly, in one of my papers, and think about, and I'm keeping this whole underlying theme sort of you know, going of stress and ANPK, and I'm looking at propofol. Now, I've all, and I was already already in the brain. I was looking at long-term potentiation. We talked about memory and, you know, stressing the brain and things like that. And, you know, I had proposed that, you know, ANPK and loss in calcium and stress is actually how long-term potentiation is facilitated in the brain and the hippocampus and learning and memory, uh, 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 you know, occurs in vivo. And sure enough, <laughs> And like you said, kind of, kind of, I don't know, usurping the researchers a couple of months later, they show that, yeah, when we inhibited AMPK in the mouse brain, it inhibited, it significantly inhibited long-term potentiation in the hippocampus in area CA1, which is the exact area that I hypothesized, which is the most studied area uh, associated with learning and memory. And they took it a step further. They said, okay, let's inhibit AMPK in vivo in a rodent model. 
in this text is uh, long-term memory formation. Amazing. Long-term memory formation was blocked Amazing. in those animals when you inhibited A and PK. So, it, 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 so I was hanging out in the brain. Yeah, I was hanging out in the brain. And uh, I, you know, I come across propofol. And I was like, okay, I'm just one, you know, a couple of, you know, not too far removed from the areas that are responsible for human consciousness. Mm -hmm. This is this kind of scared me because, you know, there's some heavyweight guys with some really big brains that are tackling consciousness. And, you know, they basically, uh, they sort of, you know, split it into two components, like the easy problem and the hard problem. Mm -hmm. You know, they call it the hard problem, you know, it's like, okay, how does electrical, you know, these electrical signals, you know, end up turning a red cup into a red, you know, a red cup right. in the brain? You know, how does all these shapes and colors end up with this picture? Right. They also say it's an easy problem, you know, which is what are the neural cords of consciousness? What are the mechanisms that's going on in the brain? You know, this, this, and that. And I, I always think it's that's interesting that, you know, a lot of people are working on the hard problem, but not too many people are working on the easy problem. And I thought, well, the easy problem is not so easy interestingly to me so you know but i'm looking at that in the consciousness and i'm not too far removed now keeping the centralized theme stress 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 i showed it was shown in my you know i showed in my paper on learning the memory that ross and calcium are necessary for long-term potentiation basically to wake those neurons up in the hippocampus now people know about calcium but ross not so much when you inhibit ross in that particular area in the brain it significantly inhibits long-term potentiation in vitro learning and memory in vivo. So I was like, calcium induces ROS, ROS induces calcium, both of them activated NPK. Hmm. I came across a study showing that AMPK is also activated in cortical neurons, hmm. you know, in, 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 in mice. And the, the, the cerebral cortex is a huge component of consciousness. Right. So I said, wait a minute, if that's so, could stress and AMPA activation giving rise to human consciousness. You know, is that is stress responsible for me looking at you and you looking at me and both of us being aware of ourselves and aware of the environment, experiencing wakefulness and arousal, which is the components of consciousness defined by anesthesiologists. It's fascinating because it reminds me of the uh, you know, we, we uh, you know we study uh, sort of embryonic uh, neurogenesis and sort of this. Um, the importance of, you know, you think oxygen is so very good for the developing embryo, but actually hypoxic environments are mm. crucial for the sort of the morphogenesis and the, um, the patterning that occurs early on. And it's not, you know, you don't want tons of oxygen around. So some of the, you know, again, there's a, a situation of a stress, a hypo yeah. hypoxic stress that guides formation of the early brain. You hit the nail right on the head because in my paper on uh, 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 jumping genes and, uh -huh. and jumping genes, and I combine jumping genes, old site activation, and placental envelop development. Interestingly, hypoxia or hypoxic environments helps or actually helps to differentiate placental cells to form the placenta. So, you know, a hypoxic environment initially helps that placenta, those placental cells sort of differentiate and start to reach out towards mom's uterus and right. sort of implant in that uterus. Yep. You, need, you need ROS. You need some type of hypoxic environment. ROS also causes, or is very much important, in ovulation. You know, the egg, you know, really can't, you know, be released from that fallopian tube unless there's some ROS. Right. So you you definitely hit the nail on the head. I I, I love it. I love the theme. <laughs> um, we we have to come back and, and do another show uh, and, and go all into uh, the hard and the soft problem. I, I think there's a, a yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, hours. Yeah. Be, before I wrap things up, though, I have to uh, I have to give you a question that everyone gets on this show um, to put all the science and everything aside for now and go into really science fiction. But this is okay because you like that. <laughs> Um, I, I, I am to pose the question, uh, and take your time with it if you need to think about it for a little bit. Um, I have a, a time machine, uh, sitting outside of my office here, and uh, I'm going to let you, Jahari Finley, uh, take a ride in it. Uh, you can go to the past, you can go to the future, you can go visit anyone you want and talk to them. You can only visit one person. You can great, great, great grandparents, great, great, great grandchildren, 
whatever you want to do, Einstein, uh, uh, Moses, anywhere in history. Um, who do you want to go talk to? And what do you want to talk to them about? And take your time with it. <laughs> but right. Um, tell us about well, it. Well, I guess you know. I'm thinking, does it have to be a person? If I can go back as far as you know in time as I want to, yeah, or, you can go see a dinosaur and like yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, <laughs> I would really, if I could exist in that particular environment, to go back to the beginning of time. You know, before the Big Bang. Ah. So actually, look and see, you know, if I could, if I had the ability to see what gave rise to this, you know, to this aberration, you know, you got these, you got these, this universe, well, not even a universe, you have something here and you have these, these, these fields, these quantum fields that they right. think existed. What caused such a perturbation in these quantum fields that it led to? you know, the, the explosion and the development of the universe. You know, that, that's what I want to look at. If I can just sit outside in space and kind of look and see, okay, nothing's going on, what actually happened? And I have a feeling that you would come back with that and we'd do a show and you'd know, <laughs> answer with stress. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Oh, who knows? It, it, it may actually be. It may actually be. Oh. Well, that, that, that's that's great. I'd probably take that journey with you too. I, I need to look through that window myself. Um, but, well, Jari, I, I really appreciate this. I you know, all the time you spent with us. I definitely want to have you back on another show. But you are clearly uh, the epitome of what this show is all about in terms of big ideas and creative ideas and inspiring future thought. And um, I, I really appreciate what you're doing. We're going to link to um, your research and your site and um, We'll have the the blog up so people can learn all about you. Um, but once again, just thank you so much for spending the time. And it's the weekend, um, but really it was very much appreciated. And uh, I look forward to hearing more about your work. Okay, of course, of course. And uh, thank you so much for having me, Ira. And, you know, anytime, you know, anytime. Well, I, you know, I would love to come back and, you know, give you an earful, hopefully not too much, of all. Oh, I, I very enjoyed it. Nice. I think the listeners will enjoy it too. So. Mm -hmm.